and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to my 17th lecture today. Today we talk about the question, shall the renewable energy production be done locally or at the best sites with the highest intensities? Already last lecture I showed you this diagram here and today we talk about the question which we marked already last time, local or production at best site. And there we had already mentioned that there was some kind of dispute between the Desertec Foundation and the community of Eurosolar and others. So let's elaborate that in a bit more detail. For local production we take rooftop photovoltaics because that is the best example for it. So already in lecture one I showed you this picture here. And today I will show you also a picture of my own roof at home. I have a flat roof, so it was easy to put photovoltaics on it. So you see the modules here and behind there you see um, another module, which is a solar thermal module. This heats up water and we use this hot water then at home for a shower or for the heating. But let's focus on photovoltaics now. I bought about as many photovoltaic modules as I could fit on my roof. So it turned out that the total amount of modules gave a total power of 9.12 kilowatt peak. And kilowatt peak is a nomenclature of photovoltaics. So the peak power is defined for a light intensity of 1 kilowatt per square meter. You might remember what arrives from the sun at the surface of the earth is about 1.4 kilowatt per square meter. Then you have the attenuation in the atmosphere and so on and for whatever reasons big people defined one kilowatt per square meter as the intensity which defines the peak power. Also the spectrum of the light is defined and the air temperature because photovoltaic modules normally have a production which depends somewhat on the air temperature. If the temperature is high the efficiencies become a bit worse normally. Actually if I look at the output of my photovoltaics, I find out that on a very sunny day I get a maximum of maybe 8 kilowatts, so we, I don't reach completely this 9 kilowatts, which it should normally, but of course um, it also depends on the angle at which the sun hits the solar modules and it's not necessarily perpendicular to the surface on my roof. So especially for you, I looked up what output my photovoltaic gives on the average over the year. And for the year 2019, I had a total energy production of 8,413 kilowatt hours. And in comparison to other years, I have to say that 2019 was a quite sunny year. I had a little bit more integrated power than I usually have. About 77% of the power I had to sell because I couldn't use it. If you count the number of hours in a year, which is 8760 in the year 2019, then you can calculate an average power over the whole year, day and night, and you get 0.96 kilowatt. If you divide that to this 9.12 kilowatt peak power of my installation, you find out that the total installation has an overall yearly efficiency of about 11%, which now is not the conversion factor of light into electricity, but this is an additional factor which says which fraction of the year we had a good illumination of the photovoltaic cells. That means that the integrated day and night power is only 11% of that what would be maximally possible if day and night so over the whole year we would have the full sunlight on our TV. So if somebody says we have a photovoltaic device which has for example one megawatt, you have to know that this is only the peak power and the actual power which comes out is only on the order of 10% of that. Yeah, because at night there's no sun and in winter there's less sun. How does this now compare to our consumption at home? At home we are four people, including my children, and I also have an electric car. So in 2019 I looked up that I used 4,636 kilowatt hours electricity. 
So I used only half as much as I produced, which sounds great. On the other hand, about 60% of what I used I had to buy from the grid because I used it at a time when there was also not enough sun in the winter or that I used it at night when there was no sun at all. So this is important to remember if you have a local energy production from, for example, solar power photovoltaics. This means that without storage, you cannot supply yourself without buying overnight and during dark days additional electricity. In addition, we are only talking about electricity now. If you look back to my previous lectures, I told you that the average European consumer uses about 5 kilowatt. This of course includes everything, so for my house it means I'm heating with gas mostly. So this includes the power of the gas, it includes the traffic in addition to the EV I use, and it includes of course all the industrial productions uh, which use energy for my clothes or for uh, all the other stuff I need including the agriculture, of course. So that means that even if I produce twice as much electricity compared to what I use, my family with four people will probably use about 20 kilowatt average, which is about 20 times more than I can produce on the average in the year with my photovoltaic. In other words, even that I have quite a big roof and quite a few photovoltaic cells, I still can only produce a fraction of what I need by myself. By the way, I believe that our family doesn't use as much as the average European person, as we save a lot of energy, but this of course is not um, to be discussed. Yeah. So now let us talk in a bit more general way about the advantages and disadvantages of local energy production and production at the best sites. So I made this table here. So let's take again the example of rooftop photovoltaics. But of course, if you really wanted to have a local energy production, you in addition would need a battery storage so that you can also use electricity at night. So what are the big advantages of a local power production? First of all, concerning security, it's your independence. Yeah, if you do it at home, you don't depend on any other companies. Uh, if there is a thunderstorm, especially in the US, it happens quite often. They have overhead lines for electricity. If there's a hurricane, the whole region has no electricity. But the people who have photovoltaics they nicely can continue unless they are hit themselves by this hurricane. Another big advantage, of course, is that you don't need a grid, you don't need long cables, so you save a lot of investment and you also save in efficiency because you have losses if you put the electricity through a grid. Another advantage is that the approval of such a power production is easy in principle, even though in Germany it's not always easy. But in principle, at least, it should be easy. It's also from the employment, in principle, a good idea because you have a lot of local value. You have a small company in your neighborhood who can install your photovoltaics and a lot of the value production is done in the country itself. This, of course, is also not strictly true because if you use photovoltaic modules from China, for example, then the money goes to China and it's not local value anymore. So what are the disadvantages of a local power production? The main disadvantage is that you cannot do it everywhere. Yeah, if you live somewhere in an area where there is little sunshine, you can't use photovoltaics. If you live somewhere where there is almost no wind, you can't do wind power and so on. So the availability of the power is not everywhere. If there are a few houses, for example, who have no possibility to produce their own power, then you still need a grid, and if you have a grid anyway, you can connect everybody again. So there are problems also. The other question is efficiency. So as I told you, my peak power is in the average only reached by about 11%. So depending where you live, your investment on the photovoltaic devices 
is not really used in a very efficient way in case you have little sunshine. So this is very site dependent and in many cases it's quite lower than at the best sites. Another problem with local energy production is when you have a high concentration of people in big cities, for example, or you have a high energy demand by big industries, which use a lot of power, then it will be difficult to produce so much power locally. Then you anyway have to have imports of energy. And then again, you can say if you have anyway long cables to another area, then you can use it for everybody. So the investment into a grid is only valid if everybody can have a local power production. Another important point is the storage. I told you already with photovoltaic on the roof, you have no light at night, you have no power at light and you can't watch TV. So you need a storage and it, this means you need a 100% storage because at night you need 100% of the power from the storage device. This still means rather high cost because these small storage devices are quite expensive and they are also not very sustainable because if you have a storage device at home it's probably simply a battery or another way of chemical storage and that means a lot of chemistry in every home in every garage and everywhere and this is not the best solution also not from the point of the environment and of the usage of natural resources. So this has to be taken in account. But still, if you go, for example, to Australia, in Australia you have many areas which have a very low density of people. And there already today it's cheaper to have your photovoltaics and your own battery at home and 100% own power production compared to these long cables in these low populated areas with the central energy production. So depending on the areas, of course, it makes a lot of sense to have a local power production. Another example is, for example, Namibia. In Namibia, there are big deserts and there's a lot of sunshine and the population is, I, if I remember correctly, something like one person per square kilometer. So to put a cable from every village to the next village for a few people is of course much more expensive than having local photovoltaics and battery storage instead of a big grid in this area. Yeah. On the other hand, in a town like New York, it doesn't make sense to put photovoltaic on the roof and believe you can really get a significant amount of power from that. So there, the situation is different. So what we learned from here is that, of course, there's not a unique answer on having energy production locally or at best site. It always depends very much on the circumstances and the use of it. So now let's talk about the other option. What about energy production at best sites? For that, a prototype of example is the production of solar power in deserts. Here in this picture, for example, you see a solar power tower. This is a big tower in the center and a huge field of mirrors around. And these mirrors focus the sunlight on the tower. And in the tower, you produce very high temperatures. And with these high temperatures, you can very efficiently produce electricity out of the thermal energy from the sun. So how do you solve storage in the deserts? So for many cases, the best option is the following. You have a big field of photovoltaic where you can produce at a very cheap price electricity during the day. In addition, you can have concentrated solar power like on the picture here. And this concentrated solar power has the advantage that you don't necessarily have to produce the electricity immediately, but you can store the heat which is produced by the sun in big heat tanks and then at night you can produce from this heat electricity for the night so that the combination of photovoltaic and concentrated solar power with thermal storage is probably the cheapest way today to produce electrical power on demand 24 hours a day. So what are the advantages and disadvantages here? 
Well, the first advantage is the cost because you have big installation and you have a big competition of different countries and different sites. You can get very good prices. Prices today are on the order of about one cent per kilowatt hour in the deserts, depending on the conditions. For the efficiencies, you can get highest efficiencies in the sense that you go with your device to an area where there is more sun than in other areas, then you get more power out of your device. And you can use devices which don't work at small scale, like for example the concentrated solar power station. They can have high efficiencies and they are a technology which works on a large scale in an efficient way. Therefore, you can also in principle have the lowest material consumptions because you use less modules for the same power as if you are in an area where there is not so much sunshine. So from the sustainability point of view, solar power at the best sites is better than in other areas. And the very important point is that if you have a big grid which connects many of those sites, a lot of the intermittency averages out. We come to this subject later in the lectures. And that means then that you don't need 100% storage, but you can live with a small fraction of storage because with the argument, if you have a big grid, there's always somewhere where the sun is shining or somewhere where the wind is blowing. So there is always some power generated somewhere. And you don't have to have storage, for example, for the night at 100%. So storage is reduced. And another point which I say is a positive point is that it improves cooperation between countries because if countries depend on each other in their power grid, that can improve the cooperation of different countries. But of course, you can also see it as a negative point, and then we come to security. So of course, if you have problems with your neighbors, or if you are a country which gets an embargo from other countries, then of course, you have a problem with your energy security. So that is the downside of it. So for that case, you then probably need some kind of backup solution. The biggest problem with this big scale international project is that the approval is typically very difficult and very lengthy. So it easily takes many years before a project is signed by all partners and sometimes even much longer. Another point which some people think is a negative point is that these installations are done by huge international companies. So, for example, you cannot produce a cable from Africa to Europe from your local electrician. So you have to have big companies involved, which also means that there's some kind of dependence on these big companies, of course, like everywhere in big industry. Parts of the solar community think it's very important not to have centralized devices. There's this motto, small is beautiful. My own opinion to that is it doesn't matter if you have a local solar production or a production at many very good sites and you have a big grid because in both cases renewable energy production is decentralized. It's not like if you have a nuclear power plant, you have a small device and then you produce all the power for the whole region for it. It's also not like if you have an oil field and you own the oil field and only you can get the oil out of it. Renewable energies is always in a sense decentralized because the energy density of the sun is not so immense so that you need a large area. And there are so many areas in the world where there are good conditions on sunshine so that there is never a monopole on solar energy. The only monopole which is being created or which some people try to create is by certain technologies. For example, if everybody is using local photovoltaics on the roof and they believe that this is just local value, this is not correct because it's clear nowadays most of the modules come from China and only they can produce it at a good price. So it's not that only one country has a monopole on the sun or on the wind. It's just the technology and that is something which can change if you really do the right industrial policy on it. 
With that, I think I've shown you most of the important arguments about best sites and local production. And of course, it will depend at the end on the situation. So in reality, you will have a mixture of these two methods depending on where you live and what your need is. At the end of the lecture now, I would like to illustrate you a little bit better how big the differences of best sites and worst sites really is, or bad sites and good sites. So let's start with the solar power potential. This shows you how much photovoltaic electricity output you get if you have a certain device. So this is given on a scale here on the left. You see it starts at 600 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak and it goes to up to 2400. So it's about a factor of four on the scale. So you easily have a factor of two or three depending on where you live and sometimes even a factor of up to four. The units you have to remember here is kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak per year. Often people forget to say that the numbers they give is per year. They talk about the annual production. So in physics, you would have to divide the unit by the year to get it right. Otherwise, you get a mixture of power and energy, uh, which I don't want to discuss here now at the moment, but which you should get right at some point. So what do we see? Of course, in North Africa, in the desert, there's a lot of sun. In South Africa, there's a lot of sun. Then in the Chile, you see there's a, there's a desert which has a lot of sun. And then in general areas like California, the Arabic island, the desert Gobi in China or Australia, all these areas have really good sunlight and they have a big solar potential. So if you live in these deserts especially, then you are very well off with solar power and you can produce solar power with less photovoltaic modules than in other areas. So it's more sustainable because it saves material because you have to produce less than you would have to produce in areas where there is not such a good solar conditions. Concerning this map, of course, I have to say that at some point we come to those things in a bit more detail because uh, depending on what kind of device you have, if you have a device which follows the direction of the sun or if you have a flat device which is horizontal or tilted, you always get different values and this you have to take into account. Now we come to the next possibility of renewable energy which is wind power. Also here you see a nice map and you see it looks completely different. Yeah. Now if you go to certain areas in Africa, uh, there's no, not much wind. And if you go to areas where there was no sun, like, like in the north of Europe or in Scandinavia especially, or in Greenland, there are huge areas with very good conditions. Also, if you go to the very south of South America, you have great conditions on wind power. Also in the south of Australia and in New Zealand, for example. What you also see is that most of the wind power is in the coastal areas. So in the coast and especially offshore, the wind is much stronger. And this, of course, you can make use of. And of course, also in the open sea, you have really good wind conditions. But of course, on the open sea, it's not so easy to harvest wind power. But also here, there are ideas of having wind power generation on ships. And then, of course, you have all the oceans where there's a lot more wind than on all the land areas. The other areas where you find more wind is in in the heights, so the higher you go on the mountain, the more wind you have, and the so details you have to look at the map. The unit here is given in watt per square meter. So you have, if you have a device of a certain area, the bigger the device is, the more wind power you can produce, and therefore the scale is in watts per square meter, and it's given in this map here of a height of 100 meters, because the higher you go with your wind power station, the more wind there is. And also here the scale changes a lot. So you can, in the wind power you can easily get a factor of 10 better or worse depending on the position you are. 
So also in wind power, it's very important to be at the right spot so that you can produce in an efficient way your wind power. So the same wind power generator can produce a lot more wind power in a certain area compared to another area. So also here we have a sustainability argument if you want to save materials and you don't want to have an infinite amount of wind power stations then you should better go to areas where there's a lot of wind. The next map shows you the hydropower potential. This is here part of Europe on this map and you can see if you go to the Alps or if you go to Norway you have these red dots which is uh, areas where there's a very good hydropower potential and then you have certain lines in the map. These are lines where there are rivers. So for using hydropower you need two things. You first of all need water, so you need rivers basically. And secondly, if you want to generate power with water, the water has to flow down from a mountain. So you need mountains and you need water. And this is the case, as I said, in the Alps or in Norway or in Scotland, for example, but it's not the case everywhere. Sometimes there are big mountains, but there's no water, and sometimes there is a lot of water, but no mountains, so it's difficult to get energy out of it. The next large capacity for renewable energy is biomass and biogas. This you produce from biological products, so vegetation, and if you look at the map about vegetation, you find out that this is very diverse. It's very different in many different areas on the globe. So you have to look in much more detail. You can't easily measure a global capacity here. For making use of biomass, you have to have a lot of vegetation, which means you have to be in an area where there is enough water, where the ground is good enough, and where there is enough sunshine. So if you go to the desert in North Africa, for example, this is not a good area for biomass, of course, because there's no water. If you go to the very north of the globe, there's not so much sun. In some other areas, it's too hot or too dry. So it very much depends on all kinds of aspects. And the main aspect, of course, is that it competes with agriculture, with the production of food. And also it competes with biodiversity and with the protection of nature. So for example, if you go to Brazil, in the Amazon area, there's a lot of rainforest growing there, but it's probably not a good idea to do specific production of biomass in this area. So biomass is the part of the renewable energy, which is very critical in many aspects. And as a last map, I show you a map about geothermal potential. Geothermal potential is, of course, very great in Iceland. There's vulcanism and the, the ground is very hot there. And there's also a big geothermal power station. Similar, you find something in New Zealand. And then on the potential, how to use geothermic energy depends very much on what you want to have it for. If you want to produce electrical power, it's much more difficult compared to using it for heating houses. Yeah. So this is also something which has to be discussed in much more detail. There's no general statement about that. As a last point today, I want to talk about Desertec again. So the Desertec concept was published in 2008. That is when we founded the Desertec Foundation. I was one of the founders of it. And even though I have my own photovoltaic at home, I believe that the Desertec concept is finally the better concept. And this is still valid today, even though a lot of the details have changed in this regard. What is Desertec about? Desertec was about producing renewable energies where the production is most cost effective. So this is the idea of going to the best places with the best potential. And Desertec has its name from desert because the potential of the desert is huge. As you already know, in the desert you can use two kinds of technologies. One is photovoltaics and one is concentrated solar power, as you see it here on these icons. And the idea was not only to use solar power from the desert, but also to use wind power. Wind power, for example, 
from the coast of North Africa. In Morocco, for example, there's a good area for wind power. But then, of course, everywhere along the coast and offshore. And of course, the idea was to also use hydropower, biomass and ge geothermal area, but only in those areas uh, where there is an abundance of it. So the concept of Desertec is to use all technologies which are available, wind at the coast, solar in the deserts, and using large-scale installations. And in addition to that, we need a high-voltage DC grid, direct current grid, in order to connect the consumers and the producers, which are not at the same place in this concept. And in addition of bringing the power from the producer to the consumer, the grid has another second very important function, which is to average out fluctuations as well in the production as also in the consumption. So this was the idea. This was a big thing at this time. But finally, it is still not realized this way, but there's still hope that this is still the future. And not to forget another important aim of the Desert Tech Foundation, a geopolitical aim was, and that was at the time before the financial crisis and before the Arabic Spring, and the situation was quite different there at this time. Today it's not easier. But what was the aim? The aim was to build bridges between Europe and Africa. And this is still important today because there's a large gradient of prosperity between Europe and Africa. And this is, from the geopolitical point of view, a very unstable situation which has to change. And at that time, one very important point was to transfer the knowledge which was available in Europe at that time and to invest in the South. And the advantage for Africa was that this way you get employment in Africa because there was a high level of unemployment and still is. And it should reduce poverty in Africa because if they have their own power generation and if they get money for producing power, then they can build up their own industry and their own business in an easier way. And the other aim of Desertec, of course, was to accelerate the renewable energy transition. At that time, concentrating solar power and wind power were the main two things to do. Uh, today, photovoltaics is so cheap that this is one of the biggest players nowadays. One of the propaganda plots of Desertec versus red squares here. There's one red square, which the biggest one shows you how much area you would need in the desert to produce the whole electricity for the whole world. This was from 2005. And the second square shows you how much electricity is consumed in Europe and how big the area in the desert would have to be to produce this solar energy. So these squares uh, are not meant in, this, in the way that you really build solar power stations exactly in the square, but it shows you that you need a very small fraction of the desert to produce the electricity for the whole world. And our idea in Desert Tech at that time was that we produce at least something like 10% of the electricity for Europe in solar power stations in Africa. So this is already the end of this lecture. Thank you for listening. And next time we talk in more detail about the different technologies and potentials of the various renewable energies. Thank you and hope to see you again next time.